Church. Good morning. good morning. It is good to see each and every one of your shining and beautiful faces on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. And those that are worshiping online with us, we're grateful to have you here with us too, even though we can't see your faces. Uh, while I'm talking to the folks online, um, if you log into YouTube, uh, don't just watch it on YouTube, but actually log in with your Gmail uh, username and password. Um, you can chat with us. So if you've got prayer concerns, things you want to lift up that the congregation in person you want to know about, um, log in, throw it in the chat window, and I will see it up here. Uh, if you are visitors with us, um, you got a leg up on me. Uh, for the most part, I can't tell who's a visitor and who's not yet because this is literally my second Sunday here. I'm Pastor Brian, and I'm thankful you're here. Um, but if you are a visitor with us, we do have a tear out in our bulletin that we would love for you to fill out and put in the offering plate so we get to know a little bit more about you. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. The Yaya's are canceled this week. They are several that are feeling under the weather. Um, so we are not going to have the Yaya's on Wednesday, but they will meet again in August. Uh, VBS is literally one week and one day away. So if you have not signed your young people up yet, if you have not signed up a volunteer, uh, we do have a form that Jamie emailed out earlier this week or you can call the church office and she can get you signed up and you can sign your neighbor's kids up. Just any kid that you want to come in and experience the love and grace of Christ here at Cokesbury, we would love to have them here. Uh, what else am I forgetting? BBS, yayas. Um, and I forgot to mute. Stop, 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 stop. The choir is streaming the service behind me and didn't mute their phone. I've done that too. You wait. It'll happen to me too, I promise you. Um, and the last thing, um, if being here with one another, uh, hearing a good word from God today isn't, good, isn't a good enough reason to hang out. There's food down in the Family Life Center. As soon as we're done, 
we're going to have lunch together and have, have a chance to uh, spend a little bit more time together. Uh, with that being said, I think I've got all the announcements covered this morning. If I've forgotten anything, it should be in the bowl. Oh! Men are having breakfast next Saturday at 8 o'clock, so if you are hungry next Saturday morning or just craving some fellowship, come hang out. That being said, let us just still our hearts, close our eyes, prepare ourselves to encounter God in this space, in this time, and go to the Lord in prayer. Good and gracious God, we give thanks to you for this day for this opportunity to pause and worship you, for this opportunity to simply sit still. Open our hearts, minds, and spirits to how your spirit is guiding us and help us to feel you in a very real way this day. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 May the warm winds of heaven blow softly on our house. May the May Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit bless all who enter here. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian, number 402 in your hymnals. <clears throat>
morning, congregation. Good morning. This morning's text, first scripture reading is coming out of the first chapter of the book of Colossians. Paul is salutating to the Colossians. Follow along as the verse, word of God is being read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ of Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we always thank God, for we have always heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints. Pardon me for one second. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, you have heard of this hope before in the word of truth. The gospel that has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. Guys, forgive me on this. Are you screaming? All right, verse 6. This has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. So it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras. Our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you have may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be to God. We're now going to engage in a little church calisthenics. I'm going to ask you all to stand again as you're able so that we may confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on the screens in front of you and in your hymnals on page 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Stay standing. So in just a second, I'm going to share the peace of Christ with y'all. And then I'm going to invite y'all to share the peace of Christ with one another. Keep in mind, COVID's still a thing. The people you're sharing the peace with may not be comfortable shaking hands. They may not be comfortable hugging. They may not even be comfortable bumping fists. So you can share the peace of Christ with a simple way. If somebody's okay with a hug, that's great. But be respectful of one another, okay? So the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share the peace with one another. Remembering our friends that are worshiping online, the best way you can share the peace with them is waving to the camera. Share the peace amongst yourselves and then have a seat. We can peace of Christ be with God. Peace. Oh, ain't that sweet? Peace. Peace. I'm jealous. <laughs> this is part. This is a good idea. <laughs> I don't know. She didn't get up. Yeah. Or just she's got her arthritis in her table. She's okay. On Wednesday, I couldn't make it. 
Is it children's time? No, it's a congregational, no, congregational prayer. prayer. All right, sorry. I told you I didn't have my bulletin in front of me. Oh, <laughs> right. Sorry, Jamie. Didn't mean to give you a heart attack. All right. It is that time of the morning where we take time to lift up those we're carrying in our hearts, whether they're celebrations, whether they're our, um, uh, celebrations, whether they're burdens we're carrying in our hearts. Um, it was shared with me that uh, this morning that Peggy Peak and Larry Howard both have COVID. So let's keep them in our prayers. What other prayer concerns do we have this morning? Just uh, Peggy Peak and Larry Howard. Uh, just raise your hand if you've got a prayer concern or celebration you want to lift up this morning. I see one way back in the back row. Get my work out this morning. Yes, ma'am. So we'll keep Tommy in our prayers as he's having an MRI today. Yes, ma'am. Happy birthday, Joe. Others this morning. Man, y'all are a quiet bunch. I guess you talked it all out a minute ago. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. So Uncle Billy praying for healing for him. Absolutely. Any yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Holy Spirit was definitely present as we celebrated Dale yesterday for sure. This place just absorbs sound. Yes, ma'am. Sue Shipman. Sue Shipman and Skeeter we are praying for this morning. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So, prayers for Jeff as he's having a procedure done? Absolutely. Any others this morning? In the choir, I'm not ignoring y'all. Let's I pray check. for safe travels for my son and his wife who are coming down from Pittsburgh today. To What's their first names? Uh, Mark and Phyllis. Mark and Phyllis. Set travel mercies for them as they head down from, you said Pittsburgh? Yeah. It's funny you should mention Pittsburgh. Listen to the sermon today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andy Cotton, who I don't know that any of y'all got the chance to meet in person, but she recently moved to Florida and has decided uh, she's going to continue worshiping wherever I'm preaching. So she is joining us online. Um, you will get to know her family um, as she has a lot going on. Um, Andy is asking for prayers for the family of Marriott Dion as Marriott is in critical condition in ICU. And so we will certainly keep her in prayers as well. And Andy asked for prayers for Carol and Terry, which we can do. And Andy, thank you for showing the folks online how they can lift prayer concerns up to us so that we can share them with the congregation. All right. That being said, if y'all remember, when we do the pastoral prayer, I like y'all to help out. So I'll end each petition with the Lord be with, not the Lord be with you, Lord in your mercy. 
And y'all say, hear our, hear our prayer. Fantastic. The Lord be with you. Hear our prayer. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give thanks to you for this day and for this hour set aside for your worship. Help us to realize that our entire lives are meant to be lived as worship of you. Listen as we cry out to you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Forgive us, we pray, for all the ways we have fallen short of the mark you have set, strayed from the course you have charted, sinned in action and failing to act. Restore a right spirit in us that loves you with our entire being and attaches us to your eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for all those who govern. Inspire them to look out for the interests of those whose lives they affect over and above their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for all those being affected by extreme weather events, whether it be heat, flooding, or drought. We pray for the will to work for the restoration of your beautiful planet, that all might know abundant life that inhabit it. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayers. prayers. On a day that is supposed to be full of fun, food, fellowship, and fireworks as our country celebrated its birthday, we once again had to look in the ugliness of senseless gun violence. This morning we pray for those who lost their lives at Highland Park, including Katherine Goldstein, Irina McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy, Stephen Strauss, Jacqueline Sunheim, Nicholas Toledo Zargoza, and Eduardo Uvaldo. We pray for their eternal rest in your loving presence. We pray that your peace that surpasses all understanding sustains and comforts their loved ones in this season of grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for all those injured that day, including Cooper Roberts, his brother Luke, and their mother Keely. We lift up those who are carrying physical, emotional, and spiritual wounds from this needless act of violence. We pray for their complete healing and restoration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Robert Cremo. We pray for his healing that he might turn back to you as you have already turned to him. Restore your spirit in him that he might live the rest of his days in your service rather than working against your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. We pray for all those who are hurting this day in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for healing for those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. We pray for the stranger. We pray for our family and friends, including Peggy and Larry, Tommy, Joe, Uncle Billy, Sue, Skeeter, Jeff, Mark and Phyllis, Mariette, Carol and Terry, and those we name in our hearts now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray all these things in the good and precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs>
you guys, I have a problem this morning. I went to pack my lunch, but McKenna said that she does not think that my choices are good ones. I mean, I packed everything that I like, all the stuff that I like to eat. You guys want to see? I packed some cookies, and I packed some potato chips, and some peanut butter crackers. I don't know why she doesn't think that's healthy. She seems to think, though, that, that I needed to have some fruit and some vegetables and some granola if I wanted to have a healthy, balanced diet, right? Yes. So, did you guys know that sometimes our relationships with people can be... We're going to have lunch right after this. We'll share. Did you know that having relationships with people sometimes can be like having a healthy, balanced diet? But sometimes we have to have things in our life that we don't always like. So it may seem odd, but did you know that God wants us to love and care for everyone, even though sometimes that's tough? Sometimes it may be people that we don't get along with or people that we don't like. Have you guys ever heard that Jesus said to love everyone like you love your neighbor? Well, who do you guys think our neighbors are? Everyone, so like you guys here who don't know each other, well, you do, but all of the people in the congregation, are they all of our neighbors? And we love everyone, even though sometimes that it's hard. We all need God's love. In the Bible, someone asked Jesus how could they really serve God and show that they love God. And Jesus said, love God and love other people. You should love the Lord as you love your neighbor and yourself. Even people who are different. Even when we don't want to. God will help you to love everybody around you. Let us pray. God, Jesus taught us to love our neighbor. Help us to be a good neighbor to everyone that we meet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. you to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading comes to us from the gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible translation this morning. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was also going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was. But when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. 
The next day he took two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him. And when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered thieves? The legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who proclaims the love and grace of God for all the world to hear. Now, when I was a young boy, yes, I realized that was in the last century, but I'm not so old that I don't remember it. I had three television shows that I watched on an almost daily basis. The first one was hosted by a round-faced man with a big old mustache and a jacket with oversized pockets, and we called him Captain Kangaroo. Another one was filled with the imagination of Jim Henson as Big Bird and The Count and Bert and Ernie and The Grouch taught me my ABCs, my numbers, and how to be a good friend. Most of y'all know I'm talking about Sesame Street, which is still on the air to this day. The third show I used to watch all the time in my routine always started the same. A slender-built man would come into a house, change into his sweater, and put on, uh, change into his sneakers, I should say, put on a cardigan sweater, all the while singing. Now, I think y'all have noticed that I mute my microphone whenever we're singing, so I'm not going to sing for y'all today. <laughs> I don't want to scare y'all away on my second Sunday here. But I do want to share the lyrics of that song with you. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I have always wanted to live a neighborhood in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor? With this song of invitation, Mr. Rogers, who was from Pittsburgh, by the way, would welcome us into his world for a few minutes to teach us about what it meant to be a good neighbor. Something not all that different from what Jesus was doing in this morning's lesson. In an episode that starts off confrontational, Jesus turns it around on the one who is trying to test him, and rather than sending him away ashamed, invites him to live the words he just professed. As Scripture tells us over and over again, we can test who Jesus is. We can make God who we think, we, or actually, you can say, we can try. That try nearly needs to be in that sentence. We can try to make God who we think God should be. But in the end, God is going to be God. And we can shape our wills to God's. Or we can rob ourselves of experiencing internal life here and now. 
Most biblical scholars agree that the legal expert was not being sincere when he called Jesus teacher. So when we hear him ask his question, we should hear it being asked with a bit of a sarcastic tone. Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? While the legal expert who knew God's law, as we're about to find out, used the term teacher sarcastically, Jesus willingly put on his rabbi yoke and began to teach in a way that is common for rabbis. Rather than answer the question, Jesus responded with two questions of his own. What is written in the law? And how do you interpret it? Now what comes next is so central to our faith, to our relationship with God, to our relationship with one another, and to our relationship with all of humanity, that all four gospel writers address this teaching in one form or another. Luke uses a confrontation with a legal expert this morning in an, in an undetermined place to share the news with us. Mark and Matthew both tell of Jesus teaching this concept in the temple after his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus tells us, I mean Jesus, John tells us Jesus shares this teaching with his disciples at the last meal he ate with them after washing their feet. Y'all think what we're about to hear is important? Even the legal expert who was testing Jesus testifies that this is what the law boils down to. Remember this, and we will be walking the path God desires for us. For those of you that were here last week, hopefully you will remember me telling you that all we will do in following Jesus with our lives will be rooted in this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> now the legal expert answered correctly and Jesus affirms it and tells him if he lives in this way, he will live. Yet as we've already alluded to, the legal expert didn't approach Jesus with pure intentions. He had approached Jesus to test him. To prove himself. And revealed his selfishness in the very question he asked. What must I do to gain eternal life for myself? The legal expert wasn't really worried about loving God or loving neighbor. He was worried about what he had to do to save himself. He lets a us a little bit more window into his thinking in his follow-up question. And who is my neighbor? Put a pin in that. I want to take just a moment to address an issue we all face every single time we, we pick up our Bibles. I don't care what version you read. Unless you're reading the Old Testament in Hebrew or the New Testament in Greek, you're reading a translation. I have both copies of both in my study. I invite you to stop by sometime and take a look to see what our scriptures look like in their native tongues. Now, neither Greek nor Hebrew always translate clearly, cleanly into English, which forces translators to make choices in the words they use. One reason I use the Common English Bible as much as I do is this is not a translation of a translation, 
but it is a translation done from the original Hebrew and from the original Greek. And it does a good job of capturing the essence of each scroll. That being said, there are times when I feel like another translation captures an idea better. And I will sometimes highlight that when it happens. While we're on the subjects of our scriptures, I want to address an additional challenge we have in reading them thousands of years from their original authorship. The Bible as we know it did not exist in the ancient world. This is a compilation of many separate documents that the church over the years has put together to help us better understand God, better understand ourselves, and better understand the world around us. Additionally, none of the original documents still exist. Even the oldest manuscripts we have, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, are copies of copies of copies of copies. And most of these copies are fragments that are, are pieced together by biblical experts. In piecing these copies together and then translating them, scholars have the additional problem that the papyrus paper that a lot of them were written on was very expensive and in short supply. So what scribes would do when they needed a new sheet of paper, if they found an old one they weren't using anymore, they would bleach it out. And then they would write over it again. So sometimes that old text would bleed back through. Now, this one doesn't do it because this one's written in a modern Greek style to make it easier on our eyes. But if you look at the original, original, original Greek documents, they didn't use punctuation. And they didn't use spaces. So that forces scholars to make choices as to where the sentences begin and end and what words are actually being formed? Because sometimes in Greek, just like in English, you make new words by combining other words. And depending on where you put that period, that comma, or that word, you can completely change the context of a sentence. Finally, the printing press was not invented until around 1440. So the only way to make copies of our scriptures was by hand. What if I grabbed my Bible up and handed it to one of y'all and told you you had to copy it word for word, the entire thing, so that you could share Scripture with a neighbor? How long do you think that would take you? Do you think you can make a copy of it without making a single mistake? Do you think you could copy it without smudging any of the words? Do you think you could copy it in a neat enough penmanship that if your copy is discovered a thousand years from now, somebody else can read it? If y'all have seen my handwriting, ain't nobody reading it. I promise you that. For a large portion of our scripture's existence, this is how they were passed along meaning they contain mistakes. There are places where we have even lost the meaning of the original Hebrew word, and the scholars are having to make their best guess based on the context. There are also cultural norms of the times in which they were written that are captured along with biblical truths, but those cultural norms are not meant to shape how we live our lives now. Now, I do not say these things this morning to shake our faith in our scriptures. I say them so that we have a better understanding in how we encounter them. As United Methodists, we do not believe this is the inerrant word of God. As United Methodists, we believe this book is the inspired word of God. That points us to the true word of God, Jesus Christ. By saying it is inspired, we are crediting God through the Holy Spirit informing our scriptures. 
but we are also acknowledging that our humanness has entered into them and we have to approach them with a discerning spirit to help us determine what is biblical truth and what is not. That's a whole other lecture on the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, which we'll do on a different day. But let's get back to our legal expert. In this morning, in my issue with this morning's translation where we read, but the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. The Greek word here is dikai osai. Please don't tell my Greek professor I struggled with that. The Greek word here is dikai osai, which the NRSV actually does a better job of translating in this instance, saying, but wanting to justify himself. Rather than wanting to prove himself, he wanted to justify himself. How many of us are guilty of that sin? How many of us try to justify ourselves? Jesus clearly tells us there's only one who is righteous and only the righteous one can justify. Neither the legal expert nor us, no matter how well we think we know our Bibles, no matter how faithfully we think we are following Jesus' path, none of us can justify ourselves. Our justification comes solely through God's grace which is freely given to us. That being said, our legal expert continues to expose himself, as I said before, in his follow-up question when he asked, and who is my neighbor? This is simply a polite way of asking Jesus, who can I consider not my neighbor? Jesus once again turns things around on the legal expert. One way that might be apparent to us, another way that has been lost to the sands of time. Words can change meaning over time, and when that happens, the original impact of a writing can be lost. This morning's scripture is a fantastic example. What do y'all think of when you hear the word Samaritan? You associate it with good, right? We, we call this the parable of the good Samaritan, even though Jesus never calls him good. We have modern day ministries, right? Named after the Samaritan. Samaritan's Purse is, an, is a, a non-denominational evangelical ministry. There's uh, hospitals named after the Samaritan, so on and so forth. We can name them on and on and on. In Jesus' time, among the Jewish community, having a Samaritan come to the aid of the wounded traveler would have been shocking, would have been scandalous, would have been unthinkable. They were considered the despised other in Jesus' time. They were the descendants of Israelites left behind during exile and foreigners brought in to populate the land. They worshiped God differently. They had different ideas about God. And they were not to be associated with if you were a good Jewish God follower. Jesus takes the legal expert's question and turns it into a teaching moment on two fronts. The first teaching point is that no one should be considered beyond God's grace and that we might very well experience God's grace through the kind action of someone we consider other. More to the point, as followers of Christ, there is no one, and I mean no one, we should consider other. All are made in God's image and of sacred worth. Full stop. No exceptions. 
The second teaching point Jesus makes this morning is being a neighbor is not being the receiver of God's grace. Being a good neighbor is being the bearer of God's grace. The Greek word for love here is agape. And I'm sure if you've come to church at some point in your lives, you've probably heard agape before. You've probably heard a pastor or two tell you agape is not that fluttery feeling when you've got a crush on somebody. Agape is love in action. The Samaritan was moved with compassion, probably tore his own clothes to make bandages for this poor traveler, dressed the traveler's wounds, got him to safety, and provided for his future care. Jesus' point is this. Loving God is loving neighbor. We cannot profess one and fail to do the other. While the legal expert cannot bring himself to say the word Samaritan, he did acknowledge who was the bearer of God's grace to the traveler. Who was the neighbor when he said the neighbor was the one who demonstrated mercy toward him? All Jesus had to say to him was, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do like the one you consider so despicable that you cannot even utter his nationality. Go give unconditional love in the same way you experience God's unconditional love for yourself. Dr. Amy Jill Levine, a New Testament scholar at Vanderbilt University at their seminary, addresses the legal expert's question and Jesus' response like this. For our parable, the lawyer's question again misguided. To ask who is my neighbor is a polite way of asking who is not my neighbor. Who does not deserve my love? Whose lack of food or shelter can I ignore? Or whom I can hate? The answer Jesus gives is no one. Everyone deserves that love. Local or alien, Jews or Gentile, terrorist or rapist, everyone. Now, before you write Dr. Levine off as some new age theologian distorting the word of God, let me share these words with you written by John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, about this exact same scripture. John Wesley writes, Let us renounce that bigotry and party zeal which would contract our hearts into an insensibility for all the human race, but a small number whose sentiments and practices are so much our own that our love to them is but self-love reflected. With an honest openness of mind, let us always remember the kindred between man and man and cultivate that happy instinct whereby in the original constitution of our nature, God has strongly bound us to one another. In 21st century speak, what John Wesley is saying is if we are only loving those who look like us, think like us, believe like us, belong to the same political party as us, then we're not really loving our neighbors. All we're really doing is loving ourselves in someone else. Loving our neighbor means loving the Samaritan. It means being willing to receive love from the Samaritan. It means removing other and excluded from God's grace from our vocabulary. It means loving God with all our being without reservation and loving our neighbors as ourselves, knowing that every human being that is on this planet is our neighbor.
Those of you that are old enough to remember Mr. Rogers might also know that in addition, in addition to being a children's show host, he was also an ordained Presbyterian pastor. He created the show in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood in order to address children on their level, not by dumbing things down, but by presenting them in simple ways that were easy to understand and immensely impactful. In 1969, tensions were high in the United States once again around the issue of race. Public, public pools were segregated at that time. The color of your skin dictated which pool you could use. On his show one day, Mr. Rogers was out in his yard cooling his feet in a wade pool. As he was cooling his feet, Officer Clemens stopped by for a visit. Mr. Rogers invited him to stop and enjoy the pool with him. Officer Clemens said that would be great, except Officer Clemens was, wasn't carrying a towel. Mr. Rogers said, that's okay. You can use my towel. We can share the pool and the towel together. Now this sounds like a pretty innocuous scene with two people in a neighborhood enjoying a pool together. Except this was 1969 and Mr. Rogers was white and Officer Clemens was black. In this simple gesture, with a garden hose, with a wade pool and a towel, Mr. Rogers worked to tear down a barrier that society had built up. In this simple act, Mr. Rogers and Officer Clemens embodied loving God by loving neighbor, by not seeing other, but by seeing a fellow child of God lovingly made in God's image and addressing their need. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this wonderful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Go and do likewise. Amen. 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 <coughs> Worship will now continue with the giving of our tithes and our offering.
thanks to you for these gifts that you have first entrusted to us. We offer them back to you now as our tithes and offerings directly to you. Bless them to the work of your church that we may go forth loving you and loving neighbor. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is We're Marching to Zion, number 733 in your hymnals and on the screens in front of you. Center, and we can continue worshiping God in our fellowship together. And that was one of Jesus' favorite ways to worship and fellowship was around a good cooked meal. Before we go over there, because I know if y'all are like most churches I've served, if it's not blessed, y'all are just going to stand around. So let's go ahead and bless the food before we provide a benediction. That way y'all can start eating because it'll take me a little while to get over there. So the Lord be with you. And also and with you. you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give thanks to you for this additional time that we might fellowship with one another. We give thanks for being able to sit at the table and fellowship as your Lord, your Son, our Lord and Savior fellowship. We ask that you bless this time to be nourishment for our spirits and you bless this food to be nourishment of our bodies. We pray all this in the good and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to live and love and serve our living Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.